viruses, if you called them alive, there are more viruses than any living thing in the world. And so to the realm of learning how to make effective antivirals is really, really coming along a lot faster, but we still have so much to learn about all these different virus types. From the basement to the boardroom, from ideas to innovation, you are listening to the Beyond Clean podcast, the central nexus for the people, processes, and products that are pushing the sterile processing industry forward. Each week, you will encounter diverse perspectives from subject matter experts across the country and around the globe. Frontline technicians, CEOs, engineers, and entrepreneurs with a common goal to help you fight dirty every instrument, every time. Whether you are turning in for education or inspiration, we are glad you are here. Now, turn on those washers and turn up the volume. It's time to go beyond clean. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Dr. Weva Truscott, president and founder of Truscott MedSci Associates. Weva has a doctorate in comparative pathology with a major emphasis in microbiology, immunology, and pathology. She has worked in the medical device industry for 37 years. Her experience includes laboratory testing for medical device safety, lab reprocessing and sterilization, bacterial protein isolation, potential vaccine production research, and corporate positions in biological sciences, regulatory, and educational course development roles for Baxter Healthcare, SafeSkin, and Kimberly Clark Corporations. After Weva quote-unquote retired five years ago, she started her own consulting company, Truscott MedSci Associates, LLC, and became our very own Mike Matthews' favorite presenter, and has been on the show before. We're so glad to have her back. She has been at conferences for so many years, and she actually graced us with her presence at our very first Beyond Clean conference in Houston, Texas last fall. And Mike, I'm really excited to have her back on the show. We're going to talk about viruses, but not in the same way that everybody's been talking about the virus lately. We're going to go a little bit more global, We're going to compare viruses to bacteria, and we're going to bring some science back in to the conversation, Mike, today with Weva. Yeah, and like you said, you know, Weva is always one of my favorite guests to have on the show. And viruses are so fascinating because they're so different. And what I really think makes Weva such a great presenter is she is so good at taking these very complex scientific things and changing them into very practical information that we can then apply to our daily life and sterile processing. And so I think she's going to do that with viruses, and I'm very excited. You're listening to Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Joining us now is Dr. Weva Truscott, president and founder of Truscott MedSci Associates. And Weva, you've been a past guest. You have joined us actually for our very first conference in a partnership with CCI in Houston last fall. And I know we have some other conferences in the works. Really, really happy to have you back for another appearance on our show. And with everything that's been going on in the world recently, you're one of the best guests we could bring on. Well, that's so sweet of you to say. I, that's probably not true, but I do appreciate it very much. Uh, and I look forward to be able to talk about viruses. Well, I definitely think it's true. And as you know, Mike and I are big fans. And you mentioned that we're going to talk about viruses. I almost wanted to title this episode Going Viral, but not so <laughs> much in the weeds of the virus that we're all talking about in our daily lives, but just viruses on the whole to understand them, uh, understand how they're different from bacteria, which is where we're going to start in a second, and then really relate it to the healthcare environment that our sterile process and infection control folks that listen to the episodes can really relate to. So let's start there. Can you tell everyone what a virus is and how it's different than bacteria? Because I think sometimes the two sort of get overlapped, especially in the general public and confused to some degree. Sure. And it is. It can be very confusing to many. But bacteria are much larger than viruses, just to start with, just the basics. They're about 10 to 
a hundred times larger than viruses. So you can imagine how tiny they are. Neither of them can you see without a microscope, right? You can't see them. But the microscope that you use to look at bacteria in the laboratory is not the microscope that you can see viruses with. You have to use an electron microscope, which takes about half of a room, a small room, but half of it, in order to see these virus bodies, quote unquote bodies. And bacteria, to look at them, the other differences that they have, bacteria have both DNA and RNA like our cells do, but viruses only have one or the other. They don't have both. And so we're starting to see a little bit more of the picture, how different they are. Bacteria can multiply by themselves, as we know. They can multiply inside of an endoscope if there are food and moisture in there. And they can multiply rapidly all by themselves without being inside of a body. But viruses cannot. They're just this dormant things that just sit there. And they don't have the capability to divide and multiply like bacteria do. They have to be inside a cell. And in our case, we're talking about human disease, they have to be in a human cell. So let's pretend that bacteria is, is in the endoscope and it really can't go anywhere or do anything until it is implanted into a body of some sort. It's washed into a body or in some way transported by something else like a sneezing and coughing if someone is ill until it gets inside the body. So, Wava, one thing I've always kind of wondered about viruses is do they technically fit the definition of alive when they're outside of a host body? No, they really don't. Because they cannot divide, because they cannot live and multiply on their own, they're considered inanimate dead. So we all talk about killing viruses, but really all we're doing is inactivating them or destroying them once we uh, use detectant or treat them. So given that viruses are so much smaller than bacteria, how different is the transmission process for a virus versus bacteria? It depends. If we're talking about instruments, they're both going to go into the body in the same way. They'll both be shoved in there or floated in there, washed in there. So that may not be so different. Except once they get inside the body, they will hone in to various cells. It's almost like a magnet. Once they're attracted to the cell that is very special for them, each virus has a certain type of cell that it will attack. It has a protein in there for that one type of virus that is like a key. And it seeks out, let's say in this case, maybe it's a lung cell. It seeks out a particular cell that has that receptor in it that is the lock part. And it puts itself in there and the cell then opens up a little bit. And when it opens up, then it forces its DNA or RNA, its genetic code into the cell. Once it's in there, it forces the cell. It has a code on that DNA or RNA that takes over the cell and forces the cell to produce only viral proteins and the various components multiply the DNA or the RNA so that it has all these assemblies just floating around inside the cell and they are brought together to form viruses. Most viruses within one human cell produce thousands to millions of viruses and from there they burst out and start to flow into other cells and that's how an infection starts and then continues. That is fascinating. I mean, it's almost like a computer hacker taking over something and then turning it into a factory to just make more of itself. That is really amazing. That's something that is basically considered inanimate before being in the body is capable of doing this just by simply being introduced into a host. So based on this, I'm curious, what are some of the viruses that sterile processing technicians could be exposed to on a regular basis, you know, as part of their job? Of course, I mean, primarily we're thinking about, you know, in decontam, but I suppose other ways are, are possible too. Sure. In decontam, if you think about bronchoscopes and various types of sigmoidoscopes, what you'll see there are viruses that uh, most frequently can be a threat to healthcare workers, including sterile processing. And that would be hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, although it's not very infective, to tell you the truth. 
Now, it sounds strange that I say that HIV is probably less of a threat, but the reason I do it is how many might be in that endoscope. We talk about HIV. It has 10 to the 1 to 10 to the 4 variants per, and what does that mean? 10 to the 1 would be a 1 with 1 zero. 10 to the 4 would be a 1 with 4 zeros. But if you look at hepatitis C, hepatitis C, which attacks the liver, it has 10 to the 6th, so a million virions per milliliter of blood. But an amazing one is hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is the bigger threat in that it has in one centimeter cubed, which is one milliliter of blood, it has 10 to the seventh up to 10 to the 13th. So that's 13 zeros after the one in that little tiny space. And so how much can be deposited into the endoscope? And it's going to be staying in there. Remember, uh, drying out is not going to hurt it. <laughs> and I'll get into that a little bit later. Some are more susceptible than others. But if you think about laying an endoscope down, it's a dirty endoscope. So that surface now, it may now have millions of viruses on that surface. So it's hard to say exactly. I don't think we always know all the viruses that could potentially contaminate us or infect us or give us a sty on the eye or croup, or, gee, I don't feel very well, I have an intestinal infection, you have an enterovirus. There's just so many little things that we probably don't even recognize sometimes that could be acquired for a sterile processing staff. So we're talking about concentration. I'm trying to make it more layman's terms, right? So it's highly concentrated, you know? It's like liquor versus beer. Yeah, yeah, in the blood, highly concentrated in the blood. So that means lots of viruses are going to be coming out. So running with this highly concentrated liquor statement that Justin just made, does this mean that sterile processing technicians are more vulnerable to aerosolization, maybe viral spread through aerosolization? So maybe not putting the brush underneath the water when you're brushing. Is that where the viral risk can really come from? It definitely is part of it. In some cases, though, viruses travel in aerosols. In some cases, they do by contact. And so it really can vary. Brushes definitely can disrupt an area. And since they're so concentrated, it can spew out an awful lot, just a tremendous number of viruses into the environment. It can be droplets. It can be a splash. The virus also has to be able to get into something. So if you don't have a mask on, you could be inhaling it or a respirator. If you don't have a face shield, you could splash it into your eye or into your nose. And most viruses love to work at getting through mucosal surfaces. The eye is a mucosal surface. You have the tear ducts that it can float down into that tear duct area. You have nasal turbinates, which are little pieces of tissue deep inside the nose that the viruses love to hang on to and then gain access further down the throat and into the lungs. If you have your garments open so that your scrubs become contaminated, some viruses can stay viable for a long time. One of the things I did want to talk about are the two types of viruses. One type of virus has an envelope. That envelope it acquires when it pushes through the cell. And so it's partly human because it's got the human cell envelope and yet it has those special proteins on it we talk about that are like keys. The other virus is without an envelope. So it comes out of there and it's just naked if you will. And those naked ones are very hard for you to disinfect. The ones with envelopes are very easy to heat up and it sizzles that membrane. Or if you use soap, it disrupts it and breaks it down. Or detergent disrupts it and breaks it down. If you have your garment open, your PPE open, not properly closed, you can have that contaminated, especially with those non-envelope viruses that are going to stay on there as you take them home or anywhere else. And really, if you were thinking about bacteria, you would still be worried about it. In this case, they're almost the same. Both of them can contaminate things and both of them can stay infectious. Some are more vulnerable to being killed or deactivated and some are not. So we've covered then, you know, what the risk to the sterile processing technicians are. What is the risk to the patients? I mean, so are viruses capable of being transmitted via inadequately cleaned instruments? 
Viruses are also transferred, of course, to patients, can be transferred to patients. Veterans Affairs has, has records of HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, the things that we were just talking about. And we have seen publications before of various viruses that can contaminate bronchoscopes and sigmoidoscopes and other scopes, duodenoscopes. One of the things that we don't often realize is we're cleaning a scope, and we talk historically, of, especially even my last talk, about biofilms. Well, remember I said viruses can't multiply. So your first thought would be, well, jeepers, you know, they can't be that much of a threat as long as I've cleaned it well. So what? If there's a biofilm, that's going to be bacteria. That's going to be viruses, is it? And you're right. They can't build a biofilm. But since they don't attack bacteria, bacteria are just fine about building a biofilm over the back of viruses. Now you have viruses, and remember how concentrated they were, and thus once they cover them, they're probably covering a lot more than one or two. It may be thousands. And that biofilm now becomes a prote protective fortress over the viruses as well as the bacteria. And later on, it can't be sterilized because it's protecting the viruses, or they remain infective, and then they can be entered into the patient or with high-level disinfection or with sterilization. You think it's all good, but unfortunately, they could still be infective. So that's a really interesting, Wava, and obviously everybody's concerned about that. And when we talk about bacteria, that's one of the things that we treat with antibiotics. So when somebody goes in for a procedure, they get prophylactic antibiotics, and we know that the runway on the effectiveness of antibiotics and the research and development on those yields a much lower return on investment. So we're just not seeing as many of them. But viruses are totally different, and I think we always had this sense of comfort of being able to utilize antibiotics to fight bacteria, but what do we do in terms of viruses? I mean, obviously there's vaccines, but that only prevents the infection. What happens once you get it? And that is a very important question. The antibiotics, you're right, are great on so many of the bacteria, except for those that we're starting to have resistance with. But it's very interesting to note that antivirals were only starting to be developed and utilized in the late 1980s. So that's not that long ago, or the mid to late 80s, along with HIV. That really triggered the research on antivirals. Antibiotics have no effect on the viruses, as you noted. The antivirals are actually pointed towards different things in the virus. For instance, they might be directed towards the key that we talked about, that protein that is going to go inside the target cell. If the antiviral is effective against it, it will coat it, it will change its concentration, it will destroy it. In some way, it will make it so it can't get inside of a cell. Needless to say, as we said, if it can't get inside the cell, it's not going to multiply. So it's stopping the infection before it occurs. Other antivirals are directed towards their DNA or RNA, and so they destroy it, those instructions while they're inside the cell. So they're just different modes of work. And here, remember when we talked about some are coated with that membrane and some are just naked protein? Well, unfortunately, the ones with the envelope mutate easily. So the antivirals that we make against those sometimes are getting so that they're not quite as effective because that virus can more easily mutate and get around the effect of that antiviral. So it's still a lot of work and it takes years to make and it's actually billions of dollars in order to create a new antiviral. And we always pray that it's going to be very effective. So that's interesting because you really tied it together with my commentary on antibiotics, right? It takes a long time. But do we have a similar short runway or is it with antivirals that it just takes a long time so it's hard to catch up, but sky's the limit. It's not like the viruses are becoming, you know, more and more quick to be resistant to the treatment. That's true. They have mutations so that some of them, especially with the envelope, may mutate away and that occurs some, but nowhere near the amount that bacteria do. Also, when we take penicillin or ampicillin or whatever you're taking, it's effective against many different bacteria within a certain gram-negative, gram-positive type of situation. But with antivirals, they're made specifically for that type of virus. 
So sky's the limit as far as making them. There are more viruses. If you called them alive, there are more viruses than any living thing in the world. And so the realm of learning how to make effective antivirals is really, really coming along a lot faster. But we still have so much to learn about all these different virus types. That's encouraging and scary at the same time, right? Like the effectiveness isn't going to run out, but as viruses get more specialized and the fact that it takes so long to do R&D and it's not a broad sweeping treatment of many types of viruses, what it really comes down to is the most effective viruses at causing harm are the ones we're going to spend our time not only coming up with antivirals for, but trying to vaccinate so that we can control the spread of that and cut it off at the pass, so to speak. And so that has definitely been something we've learned a lot about is how quickly can we create a vaccine? And then when we're really challenged with something scary, maybe we can uh, create an uptick or more of an emphasis on creating the vaccine, but it's still got to go through human trials and this and that. I think everybody just outside of healthcare is learning more about what it means to try to develop a vaccine, but they're also extremely controversial. There's all kinds of people that don't necessarily believe in having their children, you know, vaccinated. And so that controversy also sort of decreases, you know, adoption of that technology and makes some people fearful, even when a new vaccine comes out, are they really going to want to go get it? And so I wondered if you had any just general thoughts and following up on that. I know it's not a direct question, but it's an observation about the world of vaccines more than any virals and how that ties into this discussion. I am a strong believer in vaccination. You hit the nail on the head when you said when that virus gets in the body, if you could kill it, you could use a vaccine and stop it before it even has a chance to multiply. That even has more implications as far as the mutations. That means the antivirals that we do make, even if somebody does start to become infected or anything else is going to be effective. But if you have people not taking the vaccines, they become infected or their children become infected, the mutations can occur, which makes more and more viruses that are sort of like it, but not like it. Our antivirals don't work, and it really spreads like crazy. My heart aches when I see measles coming. I have a dear friend of mine whose daughter was around someone that had measles, and they didn't know it at the time. The person was not vaccinated. And now the child that was born is blind. So many things have happened. I have three or four friends, actually, that have something similar. It's very scary. Yeah, that's extremely unfortunate. And I think there was another really key point that I want to emphasize that you just said about how being vaccinated heads it off of the past to the point where it's killed before it has a chance to mutate. So I'm pretty sure what you said to us was that as the virus spreads out of control, it mutates, recreates itself in response to an ineffective immune system, almost like it's learning how the human body wants to fight it and then avoids that tactic or strategy by the human body to kill it and stays ahead of the curve. And when we vaccinate, it's not just that we prevent one person from getting sick. We actually prevent many other people from getting sick because we're not training the virus to be better at its job in hurting us. Exactly. That's very well said. And if you think that they're going to make a million just in one cell, they can make a lot of things that didn't work. But one of them is going to shine forth and be able to disregard the antiviral that comes along. And that's the one that will survive and multiply. And next year, you know, that will be the next infection coming. Wow, Ava, this was a, an incredibly awesome interview. We have one other one. This has been, I think, a very relevant topic, but maybe not one that is going to wear people out on the types of conversations that they've been hearing on a day in and day out basis lately. But I feel like we really educated people on something that everybody is living with in their day to day and trying to make their own critical thinking decisions about how they're going to live their lives. So here's one that's directly to sterile processing. We'll 
close on this one. And again, it's not really a direct question. It's more of an opportunity for you to add your two cents before we close. Do you want to weigh in on the do staff and decontamination need N95 masks? Because there's been a lot of debate around that. I've always thought in the GI space, potentially, yes, and maybe less so in surgical, just because of the types of devices and their potential for exposure to COVID-19. But what's your take on decontamination staff wearing N95 masks? This is a hard one. I do believe that you should always wear the protection that is going to be the most protective in any situation. Now, one of the things we didn't talk about is something like you talked about the brushes. That's one area that, although I think most are larger uh, droplets, droplets dry out. And they could be small enough to be inhaled around the edges of a regular mask. And so wearing a respirator is going to definitely give you more of a a protection. But also, if you're doing your ultrasonic cleaning, first of all, I've got to emphasize they do create aerosols. Those aerosols are very tiny. You don't see them coming up. And they are going into the air. You've got the lid on. You've got to keep it on the minute you start it and until it is totally done. Lifting it up, allowing that aerosol to come, and if you'd had a respirator on, you would have been protected from those, at least until you get the top fixed. But there are many scenarios that, as you had stated before, other than wearing a respirator, as you're using your brush, you're taught since early times is to make sure that they're underneath the water level so that they aren't spraying. A respirator is just more protection, just like wearing a shield. Maybe you aren't going to always flash on your shield. Maybe it doesn't seem like it's important, but it's the time that suddenly there are the small droplets, there are the splatters, there are the sprays, and you've been protected. Maybe you don't even think about it anymore, but you've been protected. Yeah, that's fantastic. We also have identified our topic for your next appearance on the podcast. It'll definitely be aerosols because that's one that we haven't really dove into. And I can just see a bigger conversation around that. So keep that in the back of your mind. That's what we're coming to you for next. Great job educating us on viruses on the episode today, Wava. You're a great friend of the show and we love having you on and looking forward to seeing you once we can have some in-person conversations conferences again and and being able to continue to get you in front of a crowd because you do an amazing job at educating and entertaining. So thanks for coming on today. It's very kind. And thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. That was Dr. Wava Truscott, president and founder of Truscott MedSci Associates, and talking about viruses today, Mike, in a very general sense, but was interesting because I really liked the whole part of the conversation where we compared antibiotics to antivirals, but there is no virus version for bacteria, and that's a big part of preventing mutations. I think you could tell I got pretty excited about that part of the conversation, and And I think it was really important to have Weva on to dissect all those different elements of the spread of infection because it is, it's bacteria, it's viruses, and they both get handled in very different ways. Yeah, absolutely. And I I mean, I think it's very telling that, you know, we've done a ton of episodes and we've talked a lot about bacteria. We've even had a couple of episodes on prions, and yet we still have not had an episode that was purely dedicated to viruses. And yet, you know, right now we've got the COVID-19 pandemic. Previous to this, you know, there were other pandemics that were concerns, or even if they didn't quite make it to the level of a true pandemic, they were nevertheless on the radar. And those are all viruses. Viruses, And so it, it seems like this is a definite blind spot for us that bacteria and even prions get all the attention and nobody seems to talk about viruses beyond make sure you get vaccinated. Yeah, Mike, that's absolutely right. And then a lot of times when you say virus, people just think flu. So it is oversimplified in a way. Another virus, as you were talking about some of the ones recently, was Ebola. And that was a very scary one. And I actually remember I was at an airport, at your airport, by the way, Little Rock, Arkansas. And I remember it was during the Ebola outbreak. And they didn't let me get off the plane for a little while because they thought that they had somebody 
somebody who had Ebola on one of the other planes that had deboarded into the airport. And so we all had to sit around and wait until somebody from state and local government and infection control were able to come and sort of clear us to get off of our plane. I almost thought they were going to send us back in the air and take me back to where I came from. Well, that's crazy. I had no idea that happened. And of course, it happened at what is, in my opinion, the best airport in the world, the Little Rock Airport, because it's just so convenient. Man, what a crazy story. And you're absolutely right. Like, it it seems like the ones that really do get the global alarm sounding are always viruses. All right. Absolutely it is. And we know that all too well these days, but that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to Beyond Clean on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. We would certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode, just send an email to info at beyondclean.net. On behalf of Mike and myself, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Beyond Clean. Thank you.